I want to thank you for watching this message. Hungry Hearts Ministries is a non-denominational church which is Torah observant and spirit filled with the use of certain Hebrew worship tools like the menorah or this tallit. We be believe that Yeshua Messiah died to pay for the sins of all mankind. Having accepted that sacrifice for sins, we live by God's laws and commandments. We're filled with his spirit and we worship him with it. Today's message is the light of the world and we're going to talk about Yeshua Messiah as the light of the world. And so many times this is talked about in a devotional, uh, metaphorical type, type of way, and all of that is, that is all good and correct. But in Hebrew interpretation, there's four levels. One is Peshat, which is the literal meaning of the word. And then there is Derosh, which is a right now application to your life. There is Ramez, which is a kingdom application of the verse. And there's a deep spiritual sowed meaning. So when we talk about a lot of verses, like Jesus being the light of the world, we do so in a metaphorical way. But it is not always the only way to look at those verses. There is a hard scientific way to look at those verses, which is just as valid as the metaphorical make me feel good right now verse. Now, come on. We all need a right now make me feel good verse. Oh, come on. I, I, I don't know the rest of y'all, but I had to live through 2020, and I needed some right now. Come on. Give me an amen there, somebody. I needed some right now make me feel good verses. Okay. Now, but I also got to look at all the other things and the ways to look at these verses, because if we just look at a lot of these verses about light being something to make me feel good for the moment, we miss the story. Now, we don't want to miss these stories here, right? We're from Tennessee, so I don't know, I'm old, but they used to have a little song on Hee Haw that said, you know, uh, we don't believe in repeating gossip, so listen close the first time. Well, I'm, I guess I'm the only one old, but anyway. Huh. Oh, okay, all right. Well, we had two, uh, two of us in here, a little... little, little. So Hanukkah is the Jewish festival of lights. Josephus said you could read a miniature Bible from the Mount of Olives from all the lights lit in Jerusalem during the festival of lights in the first century. Yeshua was born on Rosh Hashanah in the fall, not in a couple weeks from now in December. Now a lot of you that follow Hungry Hearts realize that December 25th is a pagan celebration, so we don't do that. And um, we have a great book that we'll offer you for $14, and uh, that includes shipping and sales tax. If you want to understand how all that paganism got into early Christianity, it's a great book, Ancient Roman Celebrations and Their Adaptation by Early Christianity by Evangelist Kelly McDonald. So if you want to email me at, uh, at HungryHeartsMIM at AOL.com, send me a check, 14 bucks, we'll get it right out. You can purchase this on our website, HungryHeartsMinistry.com or HungryHeartsChurch.com, and we'll get it right out to you. Um, so he's born in the fall on Rosh Hashanah. Now, Jewish legend has it that Adam was created in the fall during the same festival of Rosh Hashanah. So what this means is the first man, Adam, came into the world on the same day as the second man, Adam. Oh, y'all get that. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 15, the second man, Adam, had to come and fix what the first man, Adam, met. All right. You, you with me so far? We, we go, I, I said all that for a reason. So, Miss Sandy works at a pregnancy crisis center, crisis pregnancy center. She came to me one day and she said, Bill, if you take a pregnancy calendar and set the birth date on Rosh Hashanah, the conception date is Hanukkah. So, the light of the world came into the woman during the festival of lights. Wow. Oh, come on. That, you, you can't make this stuff up, right? Wow. All right. So, talk about Hanukkah. So, Today we're going to have a chemistry lesson. How many of y'all like chemistry? Any, chem any chemists in here? No? Yeah, a little bit? Yeah? No? They all shake their head. No. We're going to get a chemistry lesson today. Chemistry's fun. They're all like, no. Well, I was a chemistry major. I love the stuff. I eat it up with a big spoon. So we're going to talk about chemistry today. But the reason why we're going to talk about chemistry is it has all to do with the Jewish Festival of Lights. Is that your time? It pretty much is. Yeah, it, the, the little things were coming out when I tried to make it higher. So, so much in modern science is based on what they call modeling. Modeling. When they first told me that, I thought we were going to make little models or something. But what they do is they think out how they think it is, and they create all of these complex mathematical m equations and formulas. Then they go out into the lab, and they observe what happens, and they take the numbers from the observations and plug them into formulas, and they don't work. 
Oh, y'all get this after a while. So they keep repeating the experiments. Well, that didn't work. We'll try something else. So we take them in a different way. We put it all together. We make all these great equations. Oh, yes, for such brilliant mathematicians. They run the programs and they don't work. Because there's a God involved. And they keep wanting to have a creation without the creator. Now, that's just not real smart. Now, I've watched a lot of atheists on TV. Come on, haven't y'all? And they all say the same thing over and over again. It just, it just sprang into being. So all of this just showed up out of nowhere. Well, I'm going to show you sort of. Actually, I just started thinking, I missed that verse in Corinth. But anyway, the pagans from ancient times, have been selling that lie from the beginning that the creation just sprang out of nowhere. As a matter of fact, they use a deer as the symbol of creation because it just sprang into being out of nowhere. Well, I got news for you. There is a creator, and he is intimately involved in his creation, and it's all in the Word of God, but it's also... In the atoms and molecules. Did not the Apostle Paul say in, in Romans chapter 1 that the, 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 the wise of this world are without excuse because the divine nature and attributes of God are clearly discerned in the creation? Did he not say that? So the more you look into the creation, there's all these divine attributes. You know, God loves music. God loves ceremony. Did you know your atoms, the atoms that compose your body are made of octaves? They're made in octaves. You know, like music? God likes music. Everything is made to music. Y'all get that in a minute. So they keep coming up on errors in the formula. So what they have to do to make it work is they have to come up with a number that makes it work. It's just, if you did this in accounting, you'd go to jail, by the way. Didn't work out, so I had, I had to put $40 in there. It didn't balance. So they come up with numbers called constants. Now, a lot of y'all have heard some of this. Now, some of y'all are looking at me crazy, but they got a number called Avogadro's number. It's 6.02 times 10 to the 23. It's the number of particles that make up a mole. And there's a complex way they come up with this out of the study of partial pressure of gases, all right? So they need constants. We talked about Planck's constant. Now, a number of years ago, we, we talked about how Planck's constant is used for the absorption and the release of radiation, it's a key word, radiation, in a black body. Now, what a black body means is like this podium does not, is not, does not glow in the dark. It does not emit light. It's a black body. So this podium can absorb light, and this podium can release light, and it's called black body radiation. Now, how many of you have ever seen the podium glow? I'm good, but I'm not that good, okay? <laughs> but all of matter can absorb photons. Oh, see, that's heavy. This is a simple helium atom with uh, one proton and one electron. And these are called shells or orbitals. This will be the second one. And to move a, a, or excite an electron from this level to that level, you have to add a photon. Now, think about that one for a minute. How does an electron absorb a photon? Because an electron is only supposed to be a positive charge. Now, if you've got a, an electron in the second shell, and you can, you can lower the energy level, and it drops back to the first shell, a photon comes out. Well, there's eight, there's eight levels. I mean, this is very basic, simple chemistry, right? You've got two S shells, and then you've got six P shells. So that's eight orbitals that you can have electrons in around protons. All right, I know this is very simple. As they come down from the most excited level to the lowest shell, you, you emit light according to the rainbow spectrum you know as Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So between these two right here is red. To go up from here is orange. To go up from there is yellow. So it absorbs it when you're moving the electron away from the nucleus, and it releases it when it's dropping back down towards why is light in there? Why is light in here? Now, this, this statement down here on the bottom, that light energy is the glue holding atoms together, came out of my chemistry book. I'll hold it up so everybody can see it. Light energy 
is the glue that holds atoms and molecules together. That came out of the chemistry book. But I want to show you something similar out of the Word of God in just a minute. Amen? Because God's brilliant. He's the one who made all this, right? Hey, we didn't come up with it. So photons are absorbed and photons are released. Light permeates everything in this creation. John chapter 1. Light permeates everything in this creation. This is important to understand. All right. John chapter 1. I've got to get a new battery in this thing. All right. Verse 9. The true light that is coming into the world, so the true light that gives light to every man is coming into the world. So we're making it all about us. It's not about us. So we talk about light that gives light to us. He's, he's giving light to everything here. He's the true light that holds the atoms together, the light that holds the molecules together. That's pretty strong, right? He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. So the true light is coming in, and the person of the God family that we know as Yeshua Messiah is manifested as light in this creation. Oh, come on, that's, that's pretty good. See, he's from somewhere else. And when he comes into this creation, it manifests light. But light is also the energy that hold, he has used to hold the whole thing together. The whole creation is held together by light. Now, light can be like a wave, or light can be like a particle. So we've been talking about photons. We're going to get into wave mechanics in a minute. Hebrews chapter 1. Now look, for those of you that are, are not um, into all this stuff, we're not going to get real deep in this, because I understand a lot of y'all don't like it. So we're, we're just we're going to kind of glancing, blow at it, right? Just kind of touch the surface a little bit. Just get your curiosity up. I know we're not going to do any algebraic equations or anything in here today, right? Okay? Just, everybody can relax. <laughs> just relax. All right, <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. The sun is the radiance, the radiance of God's glory. You see that in your word, right? Now I want you to think about this for a minute. We're thinking, oh yes, the sun, he's radiant. He's radiating God's glory. And we're not looking at this the way we're, that the words are saying it. We're looking at it the way, oh, he's just like dad. It's, it's going to be great. He's Jesus, right? Look, well, we've got to look at this. I mean, that, that, that's okay too. But we've got to look at this like light is exploding out of him because he is the radiance of God's glory. And that word glory is doxa, and that word, Greek word doxa, D-O-X-A, means the light coming out of God. So there's light coming out of God. There is energy and power coming out of God. As a matter of fact, in another place, Paul said that the Father lives in unapproachable light. That means it's so strong you can't get in there. That's pretty strong light. All right, when we're not done, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So he is sustaining all of this, the atoms and the molecules, by his powerful word. And yet what we're seeing in here is light. So he's the radiance of the Father's unapproachable light. He sustains the entire creation with a word. That's pretty strong. None of our words could do that, right? He uses what we call light to do that. Light is the electromagnetic spectrum. That's how we define light, the electromagnetic spectrum. And it covers a wide range of radiation. It starts with the miles long. When they say long, that's, that's the distance between the wave, the, the peaks on the wave. Miles long radio waves to extremely intense gamma radiation. He's the whole spectrum. When he manifests in this creation, that's what shows up in matter. We're going to get a lot better with this. Y'all going to like this. <clears throat> we call light a wave. We call it an electromagnetic wave. And it has wave characteristics. But when you shoot a photon in here, it can knock this electron completely out of that atom, like, like playing billiard balls. 
a photon of sufficient, what, they, what was the measurement? It was some kind of nanometers of, of sufficient mass can literally break a chlorine molecule in two. So a chlorine molecule is two chlorine atoms that are bonded together in these shells right here where the electrons, there's a gap in the electrons so they merge together so the electron, the outer electrons circle the whole, the whole molecule and not just the atom. And you shoot a photon in there, you can split those two chlorine molecules apart just like you're playing billiard balls and you're breaking up a rack. Hmm. Or it can be a wave. Hmm. That's interesting. So light can behave as a wave, light can behave as a particle. As a matter of fact, it's a great debate, been running in quantum physics and, uh, and chemistry for a long time, whether wave is a, light is a wave or a particle. Then along comes a guy by the name of Louis de Broglie in the late 20s, and he comes up with the idea that particles can behave like waves. And so he talks about particles having wave function and comes up with a formula for that. And so... Waves associated with matter are called de Broglie waves. This is how they figured out where this electron shell is that we call an orbital, and that's how they figured out where this electron shell is, and that's how they figured out the shells that come out of each one of these things. I, you know, I've got a, um, a three-axis drawing here. It's kind of hard to see. My drawings are not very good. So you've got the standard Y and X, and then you've got the, the Z that comes from back and comes straight forward, right? So it's a three-dimensional model here. The, this Z axis is coming straight towards you, and it's going straight back. It's just my, my bad drawing. So in three-dimensional real time, you have a wave that is location-specific. But all particles have a wave function, including the chair you're in, the body you're riding in, the podium. We all have wave function. Hmm, that's interesting. So how can this energy we call light be a wave and a particle, and how can all the particles in the hard matter that we know as sus substance also be a wave? Hmm. You can take these electrons and you can run them through a prism, not glass, but you can run them through a prism, I forget the, the, the names. It wasn't quartz. It was something else. But you run that electron through a prism, and it will, it will refract just like Newton did the light through a glass prism, and you get refraction from matter. And it's called spectra, the light spectra of matter. And I got a better one for you. Whether you heat the, the matter up with, with a torch or a furnace, or you burn it up in a fire, you get the same spectra. From every, every, kind, every kind of matter has a light spectra. Amazing. Amazing. All right. So in 1672, did you love that date? 1672 always makes me think, this, this guy's doing all this scientific work, and I'm thinking about what life was like in 1672. You know, what was life when he got up out of bed in the morning? What was it like for Isaac Newton? So Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greatest scientists of all time, wrote his famous paper. And all we remember out of it is you put light through a prism and you see the rainbow. And we're like, oh, that's a neat trick. Light through a prism and you see the rainbow. But that wasn't the fundamental part of the paper. The fundamental part of the paper is Sir Isaac Newton said, building on a previous guy named Hobbes, he said that light is a vibration in the ether. All right, so a lot of y'all never heard of that. A couple of you nodding your heads. The ether is this mysterious substance upon all which is, this is arrayed. For instance, why is the electron out here? Opposite charges attract. So how can the electron stay away from the proton? Why is it held out here? It wants to be right there. So they came up, before they even had this model of the atom, with the concept of the ether. It is a supposedly a fluid substance upon which all matter is arrayed. For, I'll give you another good one. Right? Now, Lenise loves to get these great space pictures. Right? We love space pictures for the covers of books and the, and, the, and the music and stuff. And you see these gigantic dust clouds. All right, I'm sitting there going, you know, somebody got to straighten this out. How do you get a gigantic dust cloud in a vacuum? I've never seen a dust cloud form in a vacuum. But space is a vacuum at zero degrees Celsius. Kel uh, Kel Celsius. No, 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 no. Kelvin. Kelvin. Oh, Ke Kelvin, there we go. Zero degrees Kelvin. How do you have a dust cloud? And then you're like, oh, the dust, the dust particles come together and they start to form heat. And I'm like, 
You can't get no heat at zero degrees Kelvin. Where are you going to get it from? See, you get all these crazy things they say, and I'm looking at basic science, and I'm like, that's impossible. And yet they say that that's the way it is. They say what they want. I'll tell you how you get a dust cloud in a vacuum. It's on the ether. It's there because God said it's there. It heats up because God said it heats up. You know, we start out with the laws of thermodynamics that say that matter can be neither created nor destroyed, and energy can be neither created nor destroyed, and God doesn't really care about those two rules because he creates it when he wants to, and he destroys it when he wants to, and ain't nobody going to tell him no. So we want to use it like a closed system, like accounting, all right? So when you're accounting, so you're going to do your accounting, and you're going to deposit $100 in the bank, and you debit cash, and you credit income. Simple, closed system. It's got a balance to the penny. God don't care about balance of the creation to the penny. He don't care about balance of balance it to the electrons and the protons either. He decides there's going to be more. I'll give you a good example. They got up in the morning, there was manna, food from another cosmos on the desert floor. didn't come from this cosmos, it came from another cosmos. So matter was added to this cosmos because he fed the Israelites, and they got energy from it. How's that? So there was matter and energy created because God said so. And he doesn't care about this. See, these are, these are, these are m m models that we make to describe and to emulate the behavior of matter so we can better understand it. They're a useful exercise in the, in the chemistry class, but they, they really don't live out here in God's world because God says, I want more. There's more. Now, you can't create or destroy matter, <laughs> but he can create all the matter he wants to, and when he decides he doesn't want it there, don't get in the way. So the idea of the ether was supposed to have gone away because it's so old-fashioned. It's like 1600s, 1700s. They have a new name for it now. Uh, they told me in, in Cookville two weeks ago, but I didn't write it down. I was busy preaching, but I asked about it. I, I knew a guy there would know. They got a real fancy term for it, but essentially it's the same thing. It's that, it's that nothing behind everything on which everything is, is placed, and that's what keeps it out there. You know, th this, is, this atom is mostly empty space. These are very small. The space between them, by comparison, is huge. So what keeps all that empty space out there? They can't do it. I had another one for you. We were, Elise loves these, these esoteric uh, quantum physics. She should, have, she should have taken these classes in school. She would really love it then. But she had a new, was watching the show, and they were, able to, they were able to stimulate a positive charge in a vacuum. So you've got this, this little glass box, and they are able to simulate or stimulate, make happen a positive charge in one part of that vacuum, and a corresponding negative charge showed up but didn't. I'll get that in a minute. It kept, it kept showing up and fading out, showing up and fading out, showing up and fading out. In other words, to have the positive charge there, it almost required a negative to come out of nothing, but it's in a vacuum, so there's absolutely nothing in there. But the positive charge would kind of show up and then fade out, show up and fade out. And they couldn't explain this with their mathematical models. But I'm going to explain it to you today. So if some of the reason I get tied up and I forget, you just remind me. Um, the reason we keep coming back to the ether is because of the mathematical inconsistencies in our models. I talked to you about light interacting with atomic and subatomic uh, particles, and it can behave like shooting billiards on a pool table. It can it behave like a particle. I talked to you about electrons and even neutrons can, can show refractive behavior through a prism of specific material. So how are we going to have two kinds of behavior out of one kind of thing, right? So light waves behave like particles and waves, and particles behave like particles and waves. So you're in the deep, deep quantum physics now. You didn't even know it. I took you there. You didn't even know what was going on. I took you right on in there. A hundred years later, we're having the same debates that they had a hundred years ago. First of all, this creation, this system is not closed. God, like I just told you, God can bring in more or he can take out more at will. Second, uh, energy, matter is mostly energy. There's more light in this than there is matter in this. All right, so the example the Lord gave me was a log, right? So you take a log and you burn it. You've got a nice log, pine, oak, get it on fire. You burn it down, and the pile of ashes is nothing in comparison to the size of the log. No, no, I'm not going to get off into all the gases that come out of there because supposedly the amount of gases that come out of there has the same mass as the log. But we all know it doesn't. A little pile of ash. But you got a lot of fire, I mean a lot of heat, and you got a lot of light out of that log. So what does the tree store up the light? 
Got those leaves out there in the sunshine. It's just soaking up all that light. But we know that's not what happens. We know, at least a botanist knows, that the tree is making sugar out of the light, and, and it stores the sugar. So where's all this fire and light come from in a log? You can burn anything. It's all the same thing, right? You can burn the chair. Uh, the metal will take a lot, a lot of heat to burn, but, I mean, the rest of it would burn pretty easy. So would the chair soak up light in here? Oh, yeah, we, we worship it up in here, man. Man, the chairs, they, they emit light when we burn them because they've been soaking up the light of God. Yeah, we got, well, not quite. You see, light is the glue that holds it all together. So when you, when you reduce that by burning it, it releases God's light and energy that's already in it. See, he's brilliant. He already knew we had to do that, right? He already knew we had to do that. So he made light energy and stuff so that when you need to light a candle, oh, this, is gonna, this is going somewhere later now. You remember this, the light energy, especially lighting a candle, right? Got to burn it. <clears throat> so this is, light is supposed to be the electromagnetic radiation, right? Electromagnetic wave. So I thought to myself, putting this together, I need to make a roaring bonfire and get two really strong electrodes and hook them to a voltmeter and see just how much electricity comes out of that fire. You know it's not going to happen. You know it's not going to happen. So, is light really an electromagnetic wave? Hmm. There's a lot of questions, right? So we have these models. We confidently say them in class. This is how it is. You'll put it on the test or you'll fail. $20,000 tuition, you better have it on there. Well, I mean, this is the way you say it, right? And yet, we know some of this stuff doesn't always work out, right? Hmm. There's nothing electric or magnetic about burning a log. And yet, light is the primary energy holding together atoms and molecules, forming the substances we call matter in this creation. Let's go back to basic principles from the Bible. Yeshua manifests his word in our creation with light. That is the primary way his word manifests in this creation is with light. That's why light is the energy holding everything together. This is how he sustains the whole universe with his power is with his light. We're going to get into the nature of that from God. His power, his energy used to sustain the creation manifest in our cosmos. Now, he has taught us for some time that he is not from this cosmos. Yeshua said, I'm not from this world. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. That word world is cosmos, C-O-S-M-O-S. -O -S. Same in the Greek as it is here, right? So Yeshua is from a different cosmos. And within that giant cosmos from which he is from, there's a tiny dot that's our cosmos. You know the one where you look in the Hubble telescope and you can't see the end of it? It's a tiny dot in his cosmos. He's from somewhere else and he comes here. And when he comes here, he manifests this. Because he spoke it. Therefore, that's his manifestation here. How about that for omnipresent? That means there's at least two, two different cosmoses. This one and the one he's from. Now, he created us with a human spirit. Now, that's another whole teaching. I'm not going to run the rabbi trail for you. But he put a spirit in you, and that's what gives you mind. But it's also that intangible part of you that can have contact with him from the other cosmos. So when he put you in this cosmos, he didn't just throw you out here a little clay figurine and said, Oh, good luck, you're on your own. You got the hotline. The human spirit inside you is the hotline to him in the other cosmos. Everybody with me? Now, when you receive the Holy Spirit... That is a piece of the divine from the other cosmos which changes that spirit in you and makes you a new creation. Are we, are we still on the same page? So here you are, and you've got this little spirit guy inside you, right? Here's the big you, and inside you've got a little spirit man, and that spirit man is, can hold the light of Yeshua. Nice, huh? You like my little drawing? I like the one of the guy burning down better. I mean, that, that, I, that, that's been my favorite drawing. Now, Lorenzo was telling me about the 12-headed dragon I drew one time. And <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. All right, we're going to pick up speed, so if y'all are holding on. Hey, look, I'm not going to fill six chalkboards full of stuff and then start erasing them before you get done, okay? I'm not going to do that to you. All right, Hebrews 6, verse 4. It's impossible for those who have once been, what? what's that word? Enlightened. enlightened. Huh. So we want that to be nice. I was enlightened. I, I, I learned about Jesus. It's not what it meant. When you've been enlightened... When you've received light from Jesus, when you've been enlightened. You see, your, your little guy in here is a vessel that can hold his light. Unlike the tree who has to take the light and make ATP and from ATP make sugar and then store the sugar down in the roots and then call the sugar back up in the springtime, you can absorb the light directly from Jesus and hold it in this little guy right here because it will hold an infinite amount. I'm going to show you that from, from the Bible, by the way. So once you've been enlightened and you've tasted the heavenly gift, you've shared in the Holy Spirit, you've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age. There's a power from the coming age. So the Holy Spirit gives us a taste of the coming age. It gives us an experience, and it allows us to receive light from Jesus. Oh, come on, that's, that's good stuff, right? Nobody's shouting yet. I mean, Pentecostal church, I don't mean anybody shouting, right? You can receive light from Jesus. Just pour it in. It's poured in. And you can take all you, all you can get. Yeah. Oh, y'all get this in a minute. Man, when you come to church and we, we crank the jams up, this is your time to start filling up. And you're going to suck all the light you can get out of this place. Man, you're just going to get I can't get enough. Man, put it in a disco. Man, you're suck all the light as you can get. Right? You're a little guy. He needs light. you got to suck it in. You need it. That's right. All right. So your new creature can fill with light from Yeshua. Hebrews, I mean Ephesians, chapter five. See if I see Lorenzo. When you tell jokes, they remember better, right? Ephesians five, verse twenty-seven. A, a verse that everybody in here should be familiar with. A radiant church. Radiant church. So we're like, oh, isn't she radiant in that beautiful dress? Well, that's, the groom is saying that. Everybody else is like, okay, it's nice. Hurry up with the ceremony so we can get on with the food. Where's the drinks? Adult beverages over here, yes. <laughs> that's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about radiant. The church is supposed to radiate light, and that's what the Greek means. It's two Greek words. The first one is E-N, and it means the same thing as ours. You know, I in, and the second one is doxa. We talked about the glory of God, the doxa. We're supposed to be in the glory of God, in the light of God until we glow. So this is the receiving, the light. You suck that light in there. I can't get enough light. Crack the jams up some more. We should literally worship till we glow in the dark. That's what this verse means. There's two ways you can have this, right? The first way is you can absorb light from Yeshua in the worship and then later release it. And we did a whole message on how you release that light in your trials and how the release, the absorption and release of light from your worship and your trials is just like that of black body radiation. With the, all of that, Planck's constant, the graphs, the charts, the whole thing, right? The second way is you receive from Yeshua the ability to produce your own light from the morning star. That's what the fire here is. You got, he lights your fire, and you have your own fire, and from that fire, instead of having to absorb, you're putting it out. You're putting out light. Oh, that's heavy. That's heavy. All right, I'm going to get heavier. Matthew chapter 6. It's heavy light. <laughs> Look, I bought my own. I bought my own separate pad so I could carry this to all the churches because I didn't want to draw this six times. What's this good? Matthew uh, six verse twenty-two. The eye is the lamp of the body. The eyes comes in through the eyes. All right now, watch this. <clears throat> if your eyes are good, your whole body's full of light. 
But if your eyes are bad, your whole eyes are full of dark. Hmm. Again, we're, we're, we're thinking good and evil. Oh, and that meaning is okay. That meaning is okay. I'm not telling you that meaning is wrong. I'm just telling you there's another meaning that's deeper and stronger. If your eyes are good, your body is full of light. And if your eyes are bad, your eyes are full of dark. All right? If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Ooh, that's bad, right? All right, let's look at the companion, companion passage in Luke. Luke 11. You know, every, every gospel writer got something different out of it. Is this fun? Y'all having fun? Yeah. I had a lot of fun with this. I enjoyed this immensely. So I was a little crazier in Murfreesboro last week. Maybe it's the donuts they had over there. I had a lot of donuts. They have really they have a really good donut shop. I mean, they got a really good donut shop, man. I'm telling you what, they bring those donuts. They got that Dutch crumb donut. Man, that thing is something else. I mean, it makes you want to pass out on the floor. All right, Luke 11, verse 33. Same passage, right? You even got a little title, the lamp of the body. No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. All right, if I forget to come back to this lamp, you remind me because it's important here, right? Instead, he puts it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. Hmm. It's a little different, a little, a little stronger, right? When your eyes are good, your whole body is also full of light. But if they are bad, then your body is full of darkness. See to it that the light within you is not darkness. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We can have light, light, and we can have dark light? I showed you the model of the atom. I showed you the shells, right? The shells are what's called, sta where, the, where the shell locations are, are called standing waves. What a standing wave is. You take a tuning fork and you ding it and you set it in a petri dish full of water and it makes concentric circles in the water. Those are called standing waves because they don't move. That's where the power is, the standing waves. The power is in the standing waves. The electrons are where the standing waves are. Okay, standing waves are wave energy in phase. So these two waves are in phase because the, the, the uh, wave heights and the troughs are in line. They're, they're called in phase. When it's out of phase, it cancels. All right, now I'm old, right? So you remember the old schools from the 70s, the, the, the schools where they had the different spotlights on the ceiling, and you would have light places and dark places even though it's all lit up? Remember that? Where it's light is where the light energy is in phase and it's bright. And then where it's those dark spots, they're not shadows. It's where the light waves are canceling out. They're out of phase. So what they used to do was they would take a light and shine it on a board with two slits in it. And when the light energy comes out of the slits, there would be light places where where the wavelengths are together, and there would be dark places where they cancel out. This is how they tried to prove the wave nature of light. Incidentally, some matter behaves the same way, and it proves the wave nature of particles. But my point to you is, when the light is out of phase. Think back to that. I used to go to Parkway, right? Y'all from Jackson? I went to Parkway, and they had the little spotlights in the ceiling, and they were dark places and light places. So this was explained to me like eighth grade, in ninth grade science, and they would take you out there and show you that. This is where the light waves cancel out. So I always think of that little place in Parkway. You know what I'm talking about, right? You've been to Parkway? Yeah, you, know, you know exactly where I'm talking about. All right. <clears throat> it's still the same light energy. It's just you don't see it because it's canceled out, but it's still there. It's just out of phase. The light is out of phase. So there's light light that you can see, and there's dark light you can't see, because in this creation, when, the, when they're in phase, it manifests, and when they're out of phase, it doesn't manifest. So let's put it another way. When the light is in phase, 
it has it's a standing wave and it has power and you can see but when the light is out of phase it's chaos and he's saying if your eyes are good the light coming into you is going to be in phase and it has power but if your eyes are bad the light is going to be out of phase it's going to be chaotic and it's in the chaotic out of phase place that the devil's working because he's not seen oh somebody get that in a minute it's like going under a covered bridge. So light, light is the electromagnetic spectrum. Those waves are in the form known as standing waves, which means the wavelengths are in phase together, and it's manifested in our creation. The other light is out of phase, and it doesn't manifest in our creation because light is not from our cosmos. Light is from his cosmos. It's his energy from another cosmos, and when that energy comes through the creation, it manifests as an electromagnetic wave. That's how his power and energy manifest in his creation. Because light energy is what holds all the particulate nature of atoms and molecules that we call matter and substance together. So the wave nature of particles has to be in a standing wave because when it's not in a standing wave, it doesn't manifest. Lenise one time was showing, uh, was watching them. She, we probably watched 30 hours worth of weird quantum. I mean, weird quantum physics. I mean, far out there. I love the stuff too. I mean, I was a chemistry major, right? So they showed what the mathematical model of the universe. You see all of the galaxies all arrayed out here, and it's supposed to represent mathematically the entire thing we call our our physical creation. And then they said, well, we're going to show you the dark matter version of it. So then they flip it, and it's like, look, look at, see, I'm old, right? It's like looking at the old-time negative of your pictures. But you don't see that because, see, it's out of phase. The wavelengths for that dark matter are out of phase, so it doesn't manifest in this creation. It's still there. It doesn't manifest here because it's out of phase. See, to, ha to, have a, to have a de Broglie wave for this particle, it has to, it, the, wavelength, the frequency has to be in whole numbers of the wavelengths, or it's not in phase. And when it's out of phase, it doesn't manifest in this creation, but it's still there. That's the dark matter behind the light matter. Don't tell me God's not brilliant. Don't tell me God's not brilliant and that he doesn't know all this stuff and that we think we're so smart because everything he does is a lot smarter. Hmm. So because light energy is what holds together the particulate nature of atoms and molecules. Well, look, 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 hold your place. Let's go to Hebrews 11. I want you to see this because this is what I forgot to do in Corinth. And I forgot because it wasn't in my notes. It just was something the Lord gave me while I was preaching in Murfreesboro. In the burrow. Are you ready for this? You ready? Hebrews 11. You ready? Verse 3. By faith we understand that the cosmos was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made out of what is not seen. <laughs> so all, out of all the dark matter, he pulls up standing ways for what he wants, and so everything here was made out of what you can't see because it's out of phase. <laughs> God's brilliant. He wants to make manna. He just calls up a standing wave of manna from out of the dark matter and it's all over the floor. Go pick it up. <laughs> he can take matter in and out of this creation at his will because he knows where to get it because he already got it. <laughs> all right, you ready? His word is the ether. His word is the ether. This is how he permeates the creation. His word manifests as light in our creation. It's the energy that holds everything together. Therefore, he is all through everything. What does scripture say? He is in all and is all. There it is. From chemistry. You didn't even think you liked, liked chemistry. Now you're in love with chemistry. Y'all are going to want to get you some chemistry books now. This power from his cosmos interacts with the substance of this cosmos in ways that reveal both the particulate and wave function of both matter and energy. All right, you ready? You ready for some stuff? I don't know if y'all ready for this. You ready for this? Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. That's, pr that's pretty close to the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. You think this is close to the beginning, verse 3? Genesis 1, verse 3? God said, let there be light. And there was light. Hebrew word for light. 
Aleph, Vavo, Resh. Or, it's pronounced or, because Aleph is silent. Don't know why Aleph is silent, because Aleph is the loudest, the loudest letter in there. Because Aleph represents Elohim, or God, and his voice is not quiet. So, Elohim gives the morning star through the praying prince. Come on. Right? First Peter, morning star rising. Interesting. The Greek word for the morning star is lictos, from lamp. What did Jesus say? Your eyes are the lictos of... You don't put your lictos under a bowl. You put it on the stand so it gives light. Oh, come, come on. I mean, y'all dead quiet. Y'all should be jumping and shouting up in here right now, right? Or, Olive. All right. <clears throat> Verse 14. Let there be lights in the expanse of heaven... The great light and the lesser light, right? Mayor. Mem, Aleph, Vavo, Resh. Hmm, interesting. What does Mem mean? Mem means spring. Mem means spring. The spring of light. But as we look with Rabbi Rock, Mem can also mean tongues. Come on, that's, everybody's just dead silent. I mean, all right. So even the resetting of the planet Earth after the angelic flood revo results in a revelation of light as a part of this cosmos coming into this cosmos. Since light is the total energy, gravity is one manifestation of the light energy in a body or a mass, right? So you have earth that has gravity, that's a manifestation of the light energy that's in this mass called the earth. One of the manifestations of that light is gravity. So the sun is bigger, and it has a lot of light, so it has a lot of gravity, because gravity is one of the manifestations of that light, mayor, source, that holds the solar system in place. Oh, come on, y'all. All right. You ready? The new creation in a human being can be regarded as a vessel to hold God's light. Or, it can become the torch. Remember, remember the story of Gideon's army. Remember how you have your torch and a jar of clay, and the jar of clay protects you from the devil's flood from Revelation 12, and when God blows the shofar, your jar breaks and your torch is released. Remember that? It can become a torch. We call this torch the morning star. We can absorb the light of God in a passive basis in worship, or we can receive the light of God on our own from Yeshua. James chapter 1. I've been teaching on this for years. Matter of fact, I almost had the book today, but he didn't have enough paper, so it would be next week. But the new version of uh, Rise and Shine Like the Stars will be here next week. Amen? Hey! Ho, ho, ho! He ran out of paper. <clears throat> Called me. was very apologetic. All right. No, no, he's good. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Father of the heavenly lights. Who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word... He gave you birth through the word that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. King James. First fruits of his kind of creatures. So his kind of creature emits light, and he's chosen to give us birth so that we will emit light because he's the father of heavenly lights. <sighs> no wonder. Yeshua is his express image and the radiance of his glory. Some of y'all are getting this. All right. Ezekiel chapter 1. You like chemistry now? Like it a little better? You were scared of it before I, when I first started. I'm like, oh, chemistry lesson. Oh, my goodness. They were happy about it in Murfreesboro. They were all excited. All the young people, man, they thought it was great. They said it's the best thing they ever heard. Actually, they talked about coming up here from Corinth to hear it a third time. How's that? 
<laughs> Colton was like, oh, it makes a lot more sense the second time. All right, verse 27. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire. Hmm. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant, what? Light surrounded him. When he manifests in this creation, light springs out everywhere. It has to. His sheer presence in this creation explodes light. But look at this. Like the appearance of a rainbow on a cloudy day was the radiance around him. Roy G. Biv. So when he, he comes flying into this creation to show Ezekiel something, all the electrons are going crazy and photons are shooting out on every level of Roy G. Biv. Because he showed up. Of course. Would you expect anything different once you know a little chemistry? No, of course not. So as first fruits of his kind of creatures, we should start to have some radiance. Or we should at least aspire to some radiance. Remember Hebrews chapter 6, 4? Enlightened. Enlightened. We're supposed to become enlightened. Oh, come on. See, a couple of y'all got it. First John. First John. Enlightened. She getting it. Riley getting it. Now is she ready to be enlightened? First John chapter one and verse five. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you God is and in him there is no He's got no out of phase light. All of his light is in phase. All of his light is standing wave. All of his light is power and getting it done and making it happen. There's none of that chaotic stuff in him. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the out of phase, <laughs> we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the Standing way, full, right in phase, as he is in phase, we have fellowship with one another. Blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Chapter 2 and verse 8. Yet I'm writing you a new command. It's truth is seen in him and you because the out of phase, chaotic energy is passing away. And the true in phase, full of standing wave power is sh already shining. See, it's amazing how you just substitute equivalent terms and it really just changes everything, right? Verse 10, whoever loves his brother lives in the standing wave power of God's energy and there is nothing in him to, I'm sorry, and there's nothing in him to make him his tumble. See, when you've been enlightened, the Bible should make sense to you now. No more stumbling over disputable passages. No more grumbling about God's law. You can't do away with the Sabbath any more than you can do away with the entire electromagnetic spectrum. As a matter of fact, you can probably get rid of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum better than you can get rid of the Sabbath. Once enlightened, obedience under duress makes perfect sense, and not only that, becomes desirable. Oh, man, a chance to stand for my king? I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. Yeah. Why? Because I'm full of light, and I can radiate all of it out I want to in my actions. Because I got the standing wave power. Obedience under duress. Worship becomes an enlightening experience. An enlightening. It's not just loud, annoying music. I'm here to suck in the light. Turn it up. Can we do two? I need light. Why? Because I got a hard week coming up. I got to get full. I'm going to radiate most of this out by tomorrow. Can we worship again tomorrow night? i got to recharge up. How many of you recharge your phones? Just try not charging it. Just throw it in the drawer and forget it. Leave it on, by the way, and throw it in the drawer and forget about it. Yeah. No, you can't charge it back up. No, you don't charge up in the worship. You can't charge your phone up. You'd be amazed how quick that little instruction would show you, I need some worship. Can we get the jams on in here? How long are we going to sit and talk? I like to talk, but we talk later, man. Crank the music up. Fellowship becomes a way to spur one another on to good works, especially in intense time with Yeshua in both word and worship. Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8.
church service is too long. I can't believe we're in there for eight out three hours, man. Just, when are they going to go home? I don't know. I'm getting fed in here. I don't know. And yet, and yet, we, we did have we did have a guy one time that uh, yeah, did that one that uh, we had this great move of God, and we're like, okay, church is over. Let's go eat. Where are we going to eat? And he's like. How do you do that? I said, what do you mean how you do that? He goes, we had this great move of God and all this stuff happened and you just want to go in. I said, yeah, I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> it's over now. I want to go eat. I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. And, you know. We're going to we're gonna, we're gonna, right? So Isaiah uh, chapter 8, verse 20. We quote this verse all the time in different contexts. To the law and to the testimony. So the law of God and the testimony about Jesus. If they do not speak according to this word, they have no. Oh, man. They got no light of dawn. I skipped this one here. This is the one from, I, uh, from Ezekiel. No God. So the radiance around God in Ezekiel's vision is no God. So the righteous man of God comes to the rich, wealthy man running to help the poor to bring you life with the morning star. See, every time you say that doggish, that doggish means a morning star. You just go, follow that doggish. You just follow that doggish. Doggish is your friend, Lottie. And so you just follow that doggish, right? The doggish, the doggish, the doggish. It's the power of the morning star in you. He's coming to bring that to you. Okay, so light of dawn is shakar. Is shakar. So sheen is the initial of God for El Shaddai. Chet means eternal life. So El Shaddai is bringing eternal life through the prince, which is Jesus. Rachel always stands for the prince, and he's the prince. El Shaddai, eternal life through the, from the prince. Shakar, light of dawn. Morning star rising. Oh. I want to thank you for watching today's message. I hope it encourages you to have a closer walk with Jesus and helps you to have a stronger love of your Bible. If you're interested in more information about Hungry Hearts Ministries, you can go to HungryHeartsMinistry.com, and we have many free materials available there, including our quarterly magazine, Pursuit. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.